In 2011, Australia's weather showed why it's the most variable on Earth. Only two years previously, much of Australia had been in drought. Then in 2010, the weather changed. These were just terrible, terrible times. Rains that were first welcomed as drought breakers created catastrophic floods. As we grieve for family and friends, and we confront the challenge that is before us, I want us to remember who we are. We are Queenslanders. Cyclones bore down on North Queensland, causing destruction and havoc. Well, because if I stand up, I'm literally going to get blown down the street. Now, time to understand and draw lessons from the weather that has affected us all. El Nino, the boy child. The global weather phenomenon that brought drought and bushfires had departed. Another has taken its place, first welcomed, then feared. This is what happens when La Nina strikes. On the end of 2010, Australian farmers had seen one of their best years become one of their worst. Really, I've never seen a situation where I've seen so many people so depressed. Because we'd been through the year, we'd grown such fantastic crops, and then we got to that point where we're about ready to harvest, and down she came. Farmers like Andrew Wiedemann of Horsham in Victoria had lived through years of dry, suffered in the 2009 Black Saturday fires and now were desperately harvesting before rising waters bogged tractors and ruined A-grade crops. For some in the south part of Victoria, they haven't had an opportunity to get much harvest in at all, so the financial impact on them is massive. And, uh, and I think, again, that emotional impact of, yes, we've spent all this money, grown a great crop, got to that point and copped all this rain, you think, gee, you know, how many, how many times can we get belted and, and we've got to pick ourselves up again and, and move on? How had it come to this? The answer, a weather pattern known as La Nina. Well, during the rapid transition from El Nino to La Nina back in autumn of 2010, a lot of farmers were very happy. We had widespread rainfall through northern and eastern parts of the country. And the Murray-Darling Basin, which many call the food bowl of Australia, saw its wettest year on record through 2010. And that was after a succession of very dry years from 2001 onwards. But as the saying goes, it never rains, it pours. And in the end, many farmers had too much rainfall by the end of the year. Climatologists point to a 10-year cycle of more dry, then more wet. It would appear we've just begun a time of more wet. So there does seem to be in parts of Eastern Australia a decadal cycle. In fact, the climatologists have given it a, a fairly grandiose title, the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation. Uh, we seem to go from more La Nina to uh, more El Nino type effects from decade to decade. So. It could be, if, there, if that uh, cycle does hold, it does indicate that we could be in for a wetter decade than normal. Uh, we don't know this is true, it's only a statistical relationship yet, yet, and we don't know what could cause that, but it's certainly an area of interesting research. Meteorologists and weather reporters track the extremes of Australian weather, foretelling the events, witnessing them, then reporting on the aftermath. With severe weather warnings for flash flooding issued for northern parts of Victoria. Over the last two years, we've experienced the biggest weather extremes that you can in a country like Australia, only that they've all happened in such a short space of time. We have seen an enormous transformation in terms of the weather and, of course, our landscape as a result. This sort of rain is going to lead to worse flooding than we even saw last week. We have been living through extraordinary times. Virtually every single week, we are breaking records for something. Whether it's rainfall or temperature, 100-year records are being broken, and they're really important as a benchmark because it allows us to appreciate just how significant these weather events are. 
2010 has been nothing short of extraordinary in terms of rainfall across Queensland. Over the last couple of years, we have literally experienced every extreme in Australian weather. Not only has this been extraordinary as a meteorologist and as a weather presenter, but I think these are years that Australians will never, ever forget. The intense rains dealt a deep psychological blow to those in the bush. Farmers like David Jones in the southwest of New South Wales had sunk their savings into their crops and lost a lot. It's hard, real hard. Getting to, sorry. Getting to me. But yeah, it's, it's not easy. Weather reporters witness physical signs of change. Formerly dry, even drought affected parts of New South Wales and Victoria experiencing rains and flooding not seen for generations. But these weren't normal winter rains. La Nina produces bursts of tropical rain uh, down through eastern and central Australia, and uh, more so than uh, the normal wet season rains. It tends to produce repeats, continuous bursts of tropical rain that come down, uh, carrying huge amounts of water, which we see as rain. Uh, the last time we saw a similar one to this was 1974, when of course we did see the uh, similar type floods in Brisbane. So uh, a strong La Nina uh, really just produces tropical rain coming down much further. Uh, this particular one, we saw uh, tropical rain even affecting northern parts of Tasmania, which is a much much further southward movement than normal. The last time conditions had been seen like this was 1974, a legendary year. It was the year of Cyclone Tracy. It was the year of the Brisbane floods. 1974 was also a year of La Nina. We're always trying to look at the current situation and see how it does compare with, with what happened in the past. That's a very important function of what we do and that enables us to get some sort of scale, some sort of importance uh, on what's happening uh, by comparing with the past. Looking at the past is, is a very important part of predicting the future, which sounds a bit strange. In late 2010, many lessons were still being learned. La Nina was showing her hand and she would continue to do so even more strongly just weeks later. When the flash flooding of southeast Queensland made headlines around the world. What meteorologists did know was that the weather system that brings dry to Australia, El Nino, had finished and its wet opposite, La Nina, had started. They knew this by tracking an intricate tropical Pacific Ocean temperature pattern that affects every country on the Pacific Rim. Warm water oscillates across the tropical Pacific in irregular cycles. It's a complex system of trade winds, the rotation of the Earth, and the natural cycle of warming and cooling. Rains tend to follow the warmer water, so when warm waters are in the east, over towards South America, Australia can experience dry weather, a phase we now call El Nino. And this is the phase that had dominated Australia's weather patterns for more than a decade. In 2010, sea surface temperatures over the western equatorial Pacific warmed considerably, while those of the central Pacific cooled. This is what we know as La Nina, and she brought the rains. I can't think of a worse place to be a farmer than Australia because we do have the most variable weather uh, right across the globe. Uh, during El Nino years we get severe droughts, during La Nina years we get heavy rain and flooding and we get an El Nino and a La Nina around every two to five years so they're a very common occurrence. But 2010 had something else. Coinciding with the La Nina cycle was a separate moisture producing weather pattern the negative Indian Ocean Dipole. This occurs when the equatorial Indian Ocean is warmer on the Australian side than the African side. Together, these two moisture feeders drenched Australia. Let's look at the reason why we're seeing this heavy rain, Tom. Basically, we've got plenty of moisture coming in off the Pacific Ocean and the Coral Sea, not to mention a trough. Yeah, the moisture is pouring in and it's converging along the coast as well, these very moist onshore winds. So that's why we're seeing the torrential falls. It's almost the perfect setup for heavy rain. Weather watchers like to draw from history to compare and contrast statistics. And 1974 stands out. 
a year of rain, floods and cyclones. What we saw in 74 and 75 was the negative IOD and La Nina happening at the same time. If you look at the footprint of rainfall that we saw across the country during those two years and you compare it to 2010 and 2011 when we've got exactly the same climate patterns happening at exactly the same time, it is literally like a carbon copy, which is quite extraordinary. But when you think about it, you just can't imagine something as bad as 1974 happening again until it actually happens. While many parts of New South Wales and Victoria saw their fair share of floods in late 2010, it was Queensland that was to experience La Nina at her worst. On Christmas Day and for three days after, rains drenched central Queensland. Flooding the coast from Rockhampton to Bundaberg and inundating vast tracts of land all the way inland to Longreach. Two weeks later, rain event after rain event had saturated southeast Queensland. Then on the 10th of January 2011, an extraordinary downpour centred on Toowoomba, creating a wall of water. Whoa! Toowoomba tragedy uh, was basically the, uh, the combination of three uh, things all together that happened over a very short time period. Uh, firstly, we had the uh, pre-existing saturation of the soil. The soil was a sponge that was totally full from previous rain. Any rain that uh, fell further was just going to run off. Then we had uh, high intensity rainfall for at least an hour uh, right across the area. Um, the official figures were something like 60 millimetres for the hour, but uh, we believe from uh, conversations with viewers and also observing the wall of water that came through uh, Toowoomba, it could have been much higher, even say up to 100 millimetres in an hour between the rain gauges. Then we had the topography of the area, which also focused uh, the actual runoff and the rain into a small area. So those three things together gave us that disaster at Toowoomba. The city sits astride the Great Dividing Range, 600 metres above sea level. The water had to go somewhere. You're talking about intense rainfall over a large area that is then funnelled into one small area. So you're getting these, these hundreds of millimetres of rain coming rushing down and there's only one place for this water to go. And in this case, it seemed to be straight through a country town. In fact, two country towns in particular that are now part of Australian weather history, Postman's Ridge and Grantham. Well, Queensland is reeling this morning from the worst natural disaster in our history and possibly in the history of our nation. On January the 10th, 2011, the full power of a La Nina generator rain event was revealed. Up to 100 millimetres fell in an hour on Toowoomba, and the water had no choice but to head down the escarpments. On the east side, the Lockyer Valley, sits the town of Grantham. SES volunteer Annette Fifoot was dispatched to warn the town of flooding, but was confronted by this. We came around the bend up there towards the town and suddenly the, the driver stopped because we could see a shipping container sailing across the highway. It just felt totally unreal. It wasn't possible. It was just a shipping container wasn't supposed to be in the middle of the road, middle of the highway. But um, so it took a few, a few seconds for it all to sink in that, that there was something terrible happening. A severe weather warning for flash flooding had been issued for the area, but the utter ferocity of the water shocked everyone. The river rose metres in just minutes. Water seemed to be coming from everywhere, taking all before it. Well now, 100 millimetres of rain in one hour, what, does that, what would that feel like? Now, if you can think of the heaviest thunderstorm you've ever seen in your life, 
and you were standing outside in that for one hour, the thunderstorm didn't move for one hour, that's what 100 millimetres of rain feels like in one hour, guaranteed to produce flash flooding. On the front veranda of the Grantham Hotel, they witness carnage. The wall of water, and that it is produced by very, very high intensity rainfall over a very small area. And then it's got nowhere to go except by, by gravity. And uh, then you just get this very, very high uh, volume of water that's accumulated very, very quickly, and it's running away downhill. Ah, oh, brick wall went. You watch these storms, you watch these weather events, and more often than not, you hear reports of trees down or, you know, a little bit of flash flooding. But that event was so, there was nothing to measure that against. There, it, it was the power of mother nature at her absolute worst. There is now a major search and rescue mission in the Lockyer Valley. It is a mission that is being supplied by the Australian Defence Force, uh, by police, by fire and rescue uh, staff and by emergency workers. Queensland Emergency dispatches helicopter rescue service, piloted by Mark Kempton. The Grantham was just a total shock. As we came over sort of the last of the little ranges between us and Grantham flying up the valley, we just saw an inland sea. There was literally just a moving mass of items. There was cars floating away, uh, there was trucks being washed away, there was shipping containers, there was uh, water tanks being smashed around, bits of building and debris were pouring off. Everything that would normally be there was just totally destroyed and swept away and nothing was going to stop that water from doing what it wanted to do. It was just an, un, uh, an incredible force of nature that was just smashing anything in its path. The Lockyer Valley also had intense rainfall on the 10th and the 11th of January. We had rain rates up around 60 millimetres per hour, but in between the stations which observed the rain rates, we probably had some areas that saw even higher totals. It's very unusual to get rain rates up at 60 millimetres per hour, but I guess what made this event catastrophic was that that rain was falling on ground that was already saturated after Queensland went through its wettest spring and December on records. Far below, people clung to their roofs in shock at the horror swirling around them. Among the rescued, a couple who are still counting their blessings. Ken and Francis' aunt saw the water rising around their Grantham home and took to their car to escape. They barely made it 500 metres. So I headed up this road. I said, we're going to get out of this, we'll get out of this. But I didn't look up the road to see how high the water was. And, and this big wall of water hit us. Well, it lifted the unit up just like a balloon, eh? Just like, like there was nothing there. The car was swept away. Ken and Francis dove out of the open windows into the raging waters. We didn't realise how deep it was at the time because all we were worried about was saving our lives. And we were paddling in the water when we saw the youth completely submerged. And that's where I was washed from there, across in between these two trees, here. And then we ended up in them trees over there, probably 20 foot up the tree. Even up in the trees, they weren't safe. The debris that chopper pilot Mark Kempton could see from the air was smashing everything on the ground. Look at the size of the sea. Well, this shipping container, I'd say, had missed me by 18 to 2 foot at the most, which would have devastated us and the trees would have flattened us. We could not see people that were like the ants that were trapped in trees. As we came towards a particular house to get a group of people off the rooftop, they actually started pointing towards the tree line. The rotor downwash made the tree branches spread slightly apart and we could see two heads poking up from the water level looking up at the aircraft and we were just like absolutely shocked.
Darren winched the cable back in and uh, Mark Turner, our rescue crewman, and one of the aunts came out. First to be rescued from the saplings and raging waters was Francis. Soaked to the bone, scared, considerably shocked and near exhaustion, but alive. That was an incredible rescue and uh, probably the most daunting of all of them. Ken was soon after. In all that afternoon, 43 people were airlifted to safety. Unfortunately, I can confirm that just this morning we have uh, a further death to add to the toll in the valley. We have a 13th victim has been found in a field near Grantham. People knew that we were going to tell them whatever was happening, whether it was good, bad or ugly, and we weren't going to sugarcoat it and we were going to tell them everything they needed to know and they could have confidence in the information. And that, it, for me, it was a very big learning experience just about how important information is and how comforting it can be uh, when people are facing the most terrifying uh, prospects. To, to feel that they have some small control over this awesome power of Mother Nature. You need look no further than Postman's Ridge, also east of Toowoomba, to know the terror of having no control. As the water started to rise, Charlotte Bull pulled out a camera phone. I realised that it was coming up really way too fast, so I kept the video rolling while we ran inside. You can hear me in the video and that's pretty horrible, I hate that. But at least I've got proof, because no one's... You can't understand it, you really can't understand it. Unless you live through it, you can't understand it. Oh my God. <laughs> Charlotte, her mother Catherine and father Barry bolted at the second floor of their brick home as their entire lives downstairs were washed away. When the water came, it, uh, it took everything, everything that was outside and in the bottom story of the house went. That there was, there was nothing that could withstand it. I had rung my mum and told her all the goodbyes and everything. <laughs> Charlotte Ball's video of her home being inundated gives a frightening first-hand glimpse into the horrors of flash flood. If you ever want to translate weather reports of rainfall figures and flash flood warnings into a mental image, this is it. From a weather presenter's perspective, you're trained that anything over 30 mils in an hour is going to cause problems. When you're in the office, it's colours on a radar if you're looking at rainfall. You know that yellow is heavy rain. When it gets to red, it's really heavy rain. And if you start to get the blacks in there, then you've either got a torrential downpour or hail. Oh my God, Barry's covered in this is all our On January the 10th, that black dot on the radar showing a torrential tropical downpour sat over to Woomba for an hour. You don't know if it's the end of the world or you don't know what's happening around you. We didn't know Toowoomba was affected. We didn't know any of this. We're useless against weather and I think we have to respect that. And it doesn't matter how powerful we think we are, how much we can build and make and how strong we think we are. At the end of the day, if Mother Nature wants to flood us, she's going to flood us. As we weep for what we have lost, and as we grieve for family and friends, and we confront the challenge that is before us, I want us to remember who we are. We are Queenslanders. We're the people that they breed tough north of the border. We're the ones that they knock down and we get up again. A lot of the information that I was getting was uh, information that was you know, tearing at uh, my emotions and I knew that it would tear at the emotions and, uh, and the hearts of you know, everybody who heard it. Uh, you know, we had parents whose children had been swept away in rivers who didn't know whether they were dead or alive. We had uh, children whose parents were gone and you know, we had police and rescue workers 
unable to get into these places because the weather was so bad and the roads had all been blocked. And so we didn't know whether people were in difficult, uh, you know, life and death situations and rescuers unable to get to them. You know, they, these were just terrible, terrible times. On the one hand, yes, I knew that I had to uh, keep myself together to get the information out and to give people confidence. But I, I didn't think it was, and it was a very emotional at a personal level, uh, in, just as much for me as it was for everybody. I feel like it felt for a moment that the whole state, that everybody who was sharing in this event, had a moment of when we were all just as fragile as one another. And I don't think I entirely separated my emotions from that. And, uh, you know, I think there was a moment when we all shared in what was an incredibly emotional time. The Queensland SES, the Australian military, the police, specialist help and no end of volunteers can take a bow. Their efforts after the flood are impossible to fully appreciate until you've lost everything. Grantham Mayor Steve Jones has the unenviable task of rebuilding a whole community. I think it's really important to be positive, you know. You've got to organise things, make sure things work and be really positive to people and give them some hope because uh, a lot of the people here have had really their whole lives devastated. You know, they've lost loved ones, they've lost all their property, they've got no home, all those sorts of things. And, you know, uh, the last thing they need is, is to see uh, a leader that uh, isn't giving them some hope or, or someone that's uh, finding it difficult themselves. And, you know, let, let's be, be honest about it. I mean, we all suffer through this, we all find it difficult, but I think you've really got to make sure for the sake of others you stand up and make it happen. Some residents like Ken and Fran aren't. Their house condemned and fighting their insurance company over the definitions of the term flood will have to take what comes. We've sort of lived here for 18 years and and at our age it, it's um, not a nice experience. It's just been all taken away from us. Something we worked for all our life and now we've got nothing left. Yeah. So anyway, we just have to wait and see what happens from here on in. Others like the Bull family, their house still standing, can look at the surrounding geography now and realise that though rare, this is not the first flash flooding on the escarpments. They won't wait for the next. It changes your life completely. Like an hour a week before this, we're rolling along really nicely with everything in place. Now we look at a house, we don't even recognise any of this. This doesn't look like the old house. This, this looks like something different, as though we're staying in somebody else's place. We just, some days you just want to go back to your old house. We weren't heroes. We didn't choose to do this. Um, the only choice we've got now is, is to get away from here. Rain yeah. is scary. When you hear it rain, you start to panic. People are like, oh, isn't it lovely? You um, you listen to the rain on the roof and you lie in bed. Isn't that beautiful and tranquil? And you even get CDs of rain. And now when you hear rain, you can't sleep, you can't do anything. You look, you're always looking at the creek now. You're thinking, all right, what's important downstairs that I'm going to lose this time? Some wondered whether the extremes of this La Nina could in part be due to climate change. It's just too early to tell. Well, there's conflicting expert advice from climatologists. Uh, there's there's a, a large body of climatologists are saying, yes, we are looking at climate change. We have seen this before, but we're seeing a lot more extremes. That's one body of opinion. The other body is saying that, uh, yes, um, uh, increasing temperatures will have some effect on things like El Nino and La Nina, but because our recorded history is not long enough, we don't know what that effect will have. So uh, the jury's still out on that one, I would think, but there's no doubt that the, uh, uh, the whole issue of climate change uh, is a relevant thing to bring up in this discussion. Climate change or not, for now, Queensland had other problems. The waters from the flash floods were moving downstream.
of the state of the towns in southeast Queensland had to go somewhere. Much went west to replenish the inland waterways, but ranged to the east of the Great Divide headed for the coast. First, Ipswich. The Christmas and New Year period has been anything but joyous for residents right throughout Queensland, with the last three weeks delivering some of the worst flooding that we've ever seen. Residents through Ipswich have had to watch the Bremer River rise at a rate of almost one metre an hour at times, swallowing everything in its path from roads to parklands to homes and businesses. It has put the city at a standstill, but the heartbreaking situation is that for a lot of people, the worst is still yet to come. Once the floodwaters recede, they have to return to scenes like this and assess the damage. Then Brisbane watched as flood moved its way. In contrast to what happened through Toowoomba in the Lockyer Valley, the Brisbane flood peak was a slow moving peak that was quite easy to forecast. Uh, looking at the, the river heights upstream, you can then project what they will be downstream in the next few hours or in sometimes days. Australia's third biggest city suffered a slow dance with the elements. It wasn't just Brisbane that was getting torrential rain. It was a huge area of southeast Queensland that was getting torrential falls. And these rivers were already completely swollen. And a lot of them actually running into each other and eventually, of course, the Brisbane River. So Brisbane wasn't only dealing with its own rain, it was dealing with everybody else's rain and everybody else's flood water. And the power of this water was just extraordinary. When you looked at it, you knew that nothing stood a chance. It was thundering, it was flowing so fast and it was picking up everything in its path. Just one of its feeders, the Bremer, had already peaked at Ipswich at 19.4 metres. All the Bremer floodwaters would flow into the Brisbane River because it joins below what many hoped would be the city's flood saviour, the Wyvernhoe Dam. Well before the January rains, the Wyvernhoe's relationship with Brisbane flooding had been creating much discussion. Queensland's record-breaking rain has got a lot of the locals talking, and it's not just about when this rain is going to stop. It's also about Wyvernhoe Dam's emergency capacity. You see, it's not just a water storage facility. It has also been designed to hold back almost 1.5 million megalitres of water from entering the Brisbane River in order to stop any potential floods. But a lot of people are wondering, is this too conservative? Should this extra capacity be used to actually source and save drinking water? But in light of the 1974 floods and this sort of rain, you can see how very strict flood assessments need to be made before any changes are undertaken. When you're talking about rain in millimetres or even when you're talking about floods, it's very difficult to grasp what that actually means until you see something like that water just thundering out of Wyvernhoe Dam. I was standing there with hundreds of locals who just could not believe what they were seeing. It was like Niagara Falls, the sound and, and the spray of the water was just going for metres and metres and it really gave you some idea of just how much water we were talking about across South East Queensland. Now, with the January event, the dam's time had come. Full to the brim, it had to release waters. Wyvernhoe well, Dam was planned initially as a, a water supply dam for Brisbane, primarily water supply. The occurrence of the 1974 flood changed the priorities uh, from water supply primarily to, I suppose, uh, a mixture of, of water supply and flood mitigation with a, a large emphasis on flood mitigation. But um, there's no authority, um, e.g. the state government or various departments or state emergency service or the Weather Bureau, no one said that the presence of Wyvernhoe would stop future flooding. Jeff Heatherwick was a hydrologist tasked with examining the 1974 floods in Brisbane. He knew nothing was going to stop Brisbane flooding again. Across 35 Brisbane riverside suburbs, the waters rose nearly five metres. Three metres below record flood levels of 1893. Cold comfort for some. Just when you think you've seen it all, you come across another suburb. Now I'm in Organ Flower in Brisbane at the moment and I've just been speaking to one of the residents that lives in just one street away. He's just told me the water is actually over his roof line and he only moved in a week ago. Ominously, neither the 74 nor the 2011 floods have been Brisbane's highest. 
you could say the city got off cheaply. The 1974 flood was uh, cost some 200 million. This one will be in the billions probably. They were relatively small. Um, if, if an 1893 or 1841 type flood occurred in Brisbane, oh, goodness me, it'd be terrible. Thankfully, not one life was lost in Brisbane. Though for two birdies chasing their runaway yacht, you'd have to say it was a close call. Oh my god. Is he up? Oh my god. <gasps> it took him, Jack. Yeah. flooding was predicted in uh, I think something like about 48 hours notice uh, so that was a good illustration of how um, the broad scale flood is much more predictable there was time involved and uh, people had enough time to actually take precautions. While Brisbane cleaned up the tons of mud and debris and insurance companies began to count the cost questions were already being posed across the flood ravaged southeast whether to build new dams restrict development even bulldoze houses on the floodplain. In the spotlight once more was Queensland Premier Anna Bly. Queensland's not the only place in the world. Uh, by and large, as, a, as human beings, we have settled by rivers for very good reasons, you know, and, uh, and the idea that you would relocate London or relocate Paris uh, or relocate Brisbane or Rockhampton, they're not feasible. So you do what you can to protect yourself, to keep people well informed, and in the worst, uh, most vulnerable areas, you look at, you know, things like, which we will be looking at, whether a better system of levees in appropriate places might give us better protection. Floodgates on some of the creeks, whether that's something that's viable. Uh, planning and zoning and building codes will give us better protection next time. So, yeah, then there are some parts of the state which are sort of slated for development, which we might now go back and say, perhaps those developments are not going to happen there. These were all questions to ponder, because unbelievably, the weather had another card to play, and a tired and battered Queensland couldn't take a trick. Just off Fiji, where the waters are warm, a low pressure system was building. Tropical cyclone Yazi was on its way. Quite often in the past, you only knew a cyclone was coming when it actually hit the coast. Here at the Weather Channel, we knew seven days out that there was a cyclone heading towards the Queensland coast. There are some cyclones that are very unpredictable. They make U-turns. You're very unsure exactly where they're going to go and how strong they'll be. Uh, Yasi was different. Yasi was very easy to predict, and we knew a week out that a big system was heading towards the Queensland coast. Queensland Premier Anna Bly was staring in the face of her fourth catastrophic disaster in just three weeks. This is a real testament, I think, to modern forecasting. Uh, you know, we saw a cyclone like this in 1974 take out the city of Darwin in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve, and people didn't know it was coming. Uh, you know, this time we, we had this forecast that this might be coming literally, you know, while there were still clouds forming over Fiji, before it even looked like a cyclone, we were being told it was potentially a Category 4, Category 5 event before it had even been declared or named. Modern forecasting relies on computer modelling of information collected from around the world, including data from buoys across the Pacific, reporting sea surface temperatures, wind speed and wind directions. It was moving over very warm sea surface temperatures. You need at least 26.5 to have a tropical cyclone develop, uh, up around 28, 29 over the Coral Sea. We also had very, uh, very little wind shear through the atmosphere. Tropical cyclones get torn apart from wind shear. If you have one, if you have winds from one direction at the bottom of the atmosphere and winds from a separate direction at the top of the atmosphere, uh, the system can't hold its vertical structure. And there was also outflow at the top of the storm for all the air to go. The air rushes into the centre of a cyclone, rises up through the atmosphere, but it has to go somewhere once it gets to the top. And uh, Tropical Cyclone Yasi had a very good outflow from the top. 
Queensland was ready, and Yazi arrived with a vengeance. Just at the moment, I'm keeping my centre of gravity as low to the ground as possible, because if I stand up, I'm literally going to get blown down the street. week of January 2011, meteorologists detected the telltale signs of a cyclone in the making. And every calculation showed it hitting northern Australia. So often when we're tracking cyclones, they are very unpredictable. They change their paths, they, they swing from here to there, and you never actually can pinpoint them until around 24 hours out. But the, the, the sort of meteorological setup for this was that this cyclone was on one path and one path only. Yazi started as a large cluster of thunderstorms over the warm waters off Fiji that started to spin. The spin of the Earth, which we call the Coriolis force, takes, uh, takes hold and starts to spin the cluster of thunderstorms around. And then you've got a tropical low, and uh, if it keeps on intensifying in the right environment, it becomes a tropical cyclone. This is tropical cyclone Yazi as she bears down on the Queensland coast. You can see the heavy rain behind me and also the powerful winds. I must admit, it's quite a scary feeling at the moment here in Townsville, Queensland. You can be a weatherman for a very long time and never experience a weather system like this. But once again, it's a cruel blow for Queensland after one of the worst flooding disasters we've seen of all time. Tropical cyclone Yasi shows no signs of weakening as she bears down on the Queensland coast. In weather terms, Queensland was punch drunk. The media had been saturated with images of havoc since Christmas. And the Yasi warning message was clear. We are now drawing close to the worst impact of tropical cyclone Yasi. We've got the warning area which stretches across a wide area of the coastline and also extends inland all the way to the Northern Territory border. Now, when messages change, there's confusion, there's disbelief, there's it's not going to happen to me. But when the message is the same day after day after day, you get through to people. People understand that this is not changing, there's no sort of room for error here, it's going to happen. This is severe tropical cyclone Yasi as she crosses the northern areas of Queensland. The ferocity, the energy of this system is truly amazing. You can see the driving rain, you can see the destructive winds, and every so often when there's a powerful wind gust, you get this moaning from above. It's like Yasi is talking to me. It's like she's trying to tell me something, and I think she's really stamping her authority and letting us know how powerful Mother Nature is. The noise of the winds is something that I've never heard before. The best way to explain it is it sounds like there's a 747 over your head just consistently. It's like this roar. It's like F-111 sitting on your roof and just roaring in, in a stationary position. You hear this freight train coming at you, this roar. a loud screaming noise that uh, some people find extremely frightening and will last with them for the rest of their life. She was telling you she was there and she wasn't going anywhere anytime soon and that she was in control and you were sort of reminded once again of how powerful Mother Nature is and how insignificant you are. Tropical cyclone Yazi's eye hit North Queensland near Mission Beach between 12 and 1 a.m. on the morning of February the 3rd, 2011, as a Category 5 system, the very top end of the cyclone scale. When you're getting winds above uh, 200 kilometres an hour, uh, that becomes uh, extremely destructive. That will uh, blow, uh, blow roofs off houses, uh, blow trees down, and uh, certainly produce major storm surge along the coastline. Uh, certainly when you get winds of that strength, uh, you wouldn't be able to walk outside without being blown over. Uh, you're getting wreckage blown down streets, uh, flying debris becomes a huge issue for people outside. So uh, winds over 200 kilometres an hour are deadly and destructive. Severe tropical cyclone Yasi heading towards the coast as a category 5 system. When it hit the coast, wind gusts near the eye probably up around 285 kilometres per hour. 
that sort of wind strong enough to cause widespread destruction. Now the most severe weather is always to the south of the eye. So south from Tully down to around Townsville, there was widespread damage. That's where the heaviest rainfall was as well. Around 300 millimetres fell in 24 hours. And there was also a storm surge recorded up to around five metres. The southern edge of the eye went right through the holiday hamlets of Tully Heads and Hull Heads. Beachfront houses stood no chance against a storm surge bearing thousands of tons of water, sand and rocks. To move these size boulders requires tremendous force, really, really does. It requires several metres flow depth of water, moving at a fairly rapid velocity to be able to do this sort of thing. They're quite large boulders, they're over a metre across in places, a metre and a half across. So some of them would be weighing a ton at least. And uh, they've just been rolled and bounced by the look of it and literally smashed into the walls of houses and knocking out brick walls that have been fronting the ocean through here. Snapping off trees halfway up, snapping off coconut trees at the base. Both the surge and the, and the wind probably combined together. Um, that, that's a tremendous force to be able to do that sort of thing. Fortunately, every resident along the beachfront had heeded warnings and left except for the residents of one house. That would be the strongest blow I've ever been in. I've been in a few cyclones and around the edges of a few. It just kept hammering and hammering, you know, from about five o'clock in the evening till three, four o'clock in the morning. And, um, yeah, you get gusts, real strong gusts back off, real strong gusts. And I think the length, that, the length of it and the noise was probably the most demoralising. Eh? It was starting to get to us. And that's where I think the shock came in later. Walter Adams and his brother ignored orders to evacuate and decided to stay in town to protect their dog. As a precaution, they fled to the brick house next door when Yazi took hold. It was a lucky decision that probably saved their lives. The amount of water that come up there, I'd say there's a metre in the house, then there's a metre jump up, up, up to the floor, so there's two metres at least. And I'm thinking, where's two, two metres of water coming from when, you, when you're on a, a 0.06 tide? And, and it come quick, really quick, eh? Storm surges were talking about the power of running water and uh, we saw that of course the tragic uh, incidents in Toowoomba. You get the same sort of effect with a storm surge in a tropical cyclone. Uh, moving water has uh, a huge force and uh, picking up uh, boulders and things like that is child's play to a storm surge. Walter's house is gone, made derelict by the force of nature. One wall was completely gone. The front was more damaged than the back. There was, there was nothing left, you know. We had fridges and deep freezers and all, it's all gone. In Tully Heads, residents returned at first light, fearing for the worst and hoping to salvage something. We jumped in our car as early as we could followed some people down through the cane paddocks and all the dirt roads and came down here and it was just jaw-dropping, mind-blowing, yeah. Russell Boyd's last experience of the cyclone was Larry in 2006. This time round, the damage was significantly greater. All the trees have been snapped off. The sea is now 150 feet closer to the house and we had six feet of salt water through the bottom of our home, a surge, which took everything out. Most of our possessions, all the people along here, the possessions are strewn for about 200 metres back into the jungle there, or what's left of it. It's just gone, everything, yeah. Carnage on a scale was unbelievable. It was like a bomb had hit the place, yeah. We were here for Larry, and this just left Larry for dead. Some residents will gather what's left and never return. Russell will move away from Tully Heads. 
he may come back one day and rebuild. One positive, if any positives can be drawn from such an event, is that whole communities have come together under the cloak of tragedy. Volunteers, emergency service, the military, church groups and individuals. Without any shadow of a doubt, uh, you know, we went through the most terrible of times, but we discovered the absolute best in people. People like Innisfail SES officer Alan Green. After Yazi, his first job was to clean his own house. It tears your heart and soul out, because all your life you've tried to make something better, to give your family something good, and then, you know, within 12 hours it's gone. Your whole life's just gone out the door. And he donned his uniform and started helping others. We fixed our place up as best we could and then I went back into SES and tried to help others that are worse off than I am. And there's uh, quite a few of them people out there. In 2010 and 2011, across the eastern states, and particularly Queensland, SES volunteers were clocking up plenty of unpaid overtime. The response that the SES personnel put in, whether they're locals or from down south, was just extraordinary. They were there, they all put up their hands, ready to go, got in and done a job. A lot of the public just like to know that there's somebody there that cares and, um, and that SES is there to help them get back to some normality. The repair bill for Yazi's damage across North Queensland may never be fully tallied. Conservative estimates put it in the billions. And it didn't hit a major city. It also didn't restrict its damage to the beachfront communities. The power and energy of the cyclone drove it inland. As the cyclone moved inland, it was, uh, it was starved of its fuel, that's the warm ocean waters, it quickly weakened, but as it moved further west towards inland Australia, it also brought heavy rain and flooding to the outback, uh, even when it was below tropical cyclone intensity. Second generation Tully banana farmer, Angelo Kremer, lost a lot when Yazi hit. We had a very dry year last year. I think it might be the second driest year on record and now we've had a cyclone, so, you know, it's, a very, it's very hard to predict. All he can salvage now are the plastic bags used to protect his crop from bugs. At a dollar a bag, it's worth it. It costs you thousands a day to do the clean-up. So for me to clean up this place, you know, there's 200 acres here, you're probably looking at uh, probably 50,000 to bring it into a region where I can start working on it again. And then it just goes on from there, you know. There's no insurance. You have a loss, you wear it. You've just got to keep going as though nothing happened. And, and use the best, well, you've just got to go a little bit harder, I guess, and, uh, and be careful, be more careful with your money. Angela Trimmer can stand in line as another victim in a long line of 2011 weather victims. His banana trees will grow back, but the challenge for meteorologists is now forecasting to a nervous public what will happen next as La Nina ends. This is Australian weather. We're talking about a climate of extremes. There will definitely be drought again. There will definitely be record-breaking rain and monster cyclones coming towards our coastline. This is the nature of Australia's climate. The destructive negative impacts from flash floods to cyclones during this La Nina have been obvious for all to see. The positive impacts are more esoteric. The inland river systems of eastern and central Australia are the healthiest have been in generations. And of course, with every major event, we learn a little bit more about the power of the weather and how to forecast it. We know there will be a next time when these systems occur again. We just don't know when it will be. But we can be confident that the lessons learned over the last two years of extreme weather 
will be invaluable when La Nina strikes again.